Um, so our next speaker is um, Sandra McLaren. And in keeping with Stacey's talk on the Delamere origin, we're now going to have two talks that investigate the geology of the Murray Basin, the sedimentary sequences that cover the Delamere. And uh, first up, we have Sandra, who's a senior lecturer and researcher at School of Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Sandra's well known for her work on the thermal evolution of the crust and its uh, important relationships to tectonic processes such as orogenesis and magnetism and also for obviously orogenesis and uh, hydrothermal fluid interaction with orogenesis. However, Sandra has also devoted considerable research time to understand the evolution of uh, intracontinental basins. Try and say that fast after a couple of glasses of wine. In particular, the Murray Basin of southeastern Australia. And in this talk, she will be reviewing the tectonic evolution of the Murray Basin, giving us some clues as to what might lie beneath this vast region. Thanks very much. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Bettina, um, and thank you very much to Anthony and the other organisers at the Joel Survey here in South Australia for inviting me to um, present to you today. It's my first um, ever Discovery Day, so it's pretty exciting. Um, I was a bit concerned, I talked with Anthony earlier, that I might have been the Victorian that was mentioned earlier. Um, even though I obviously work at the Melbourne um, University of Melbourne, I am actually South Australian, so please don't think that I'm <laughs> the Victorian interloper. Um, <laughs> So, the, um, so this work is, is work that I've done in collaboration with Malcolm Wallace, who's also at the University of Melbourne, and a few students that um, I'd like to mention over the years, and Jen Cheney um, and various others, John Miranda um, in large part. So it's a, a collaboration of work that we've done at Melbourne over quite some time. And Malcolm is the one responsible for this absolutely beautiful image that we'll see a few times in the duration of the tour. Okay, so we're all pretty familiar with the Murray Basin, we're all um, living and working in South Australia, but it's a, I'd just like to point out where it's sitting in terms of the continental geography. So this um, image here is a, a topographic image, obviously, and I've highlighted the Murray Basin there as that saucer-shaped depression. So it's a very, very vast epicentre that lies between the Mount Lofty Ranges here in, around Adelaide and the southeastern highlands in Victoria and New South Wales. So it's an extraordinary area, about 300,000 square kilometres, if you look at the entirety of it, which I've been informed is bigger than the area of France, so it's, a, it's an enormous area for us to be thinking about. Um, one of the catalysts for this particular project that I want to talk about today, some of the results, was the availability of this um, topographic data set that we've shown here. So this is shuttle radar data that was taken by NASA. It was released gosh, nearly 20 years ago now, in the year in 2000, the first um, evolution of this, and there's been subsequent evolutions of higher resolution versions of this. But the avail sudden availability of this meant that we could really start to see some amazing detail in the features of the Murray Basin, which are very difficult to be able to see when we're looking at things on an outcrop scale. Anyone who's been out for a drive around the Murray, around the Murray lands in South Australia knows that it's pretty flat. So this was a great way for us to look at some of the detail, and I'd like to pick up on some of those points now. Now. Um, so what I've got shown on the far right hand side is a cartoon of the um, basics of the stratigraphy and this will appear on several of the slides um, coming up and I wanted to highlight it now to show you that there's a range of different sediment packages that we're looking at that cover the basement throughout this part of, um, part of the world. Um, and obviously we've had a fantastic introduction from Stacey about what we're hoping, what we're thinking might be laying underneath the basin, and I'm going to largely talk about the, most, the more younger sediments sitting on top. So the Murray Basin preserves a record of both marine and continental sedimentation, um, and largely from the Oligomycene upwards, there are some older sediments which um, will be spoken about in the next talk as well. But I'm not going to touch the bottom bit, I'm going to start with the Murray group and work our way up. So you'll be get familiar with this diagram. Okay, so this is another nice little summary that I'll put together of some of the key results that I hope you'll be able to take away from here in terms of the ages of these sediments um, and where they've come from in terms of the paleo environment. So starting at the bottom, I'm going to start talking about the Murray Group. Obviously, there's some older sediments underneath that before we hit the Delamirian and older basement. Um, but mainly the Murray Group is what most of us are probably most familiar with when we think about the Murray Basin. It's what makes up the beautiful yellow cliffs that we see along the southern reaches here in South Australia. Um, above that, there's been a major unconformity, which I'll talk more about in a moment, a period of non-deposition that we see a, uh, through a lot of the basins in southeastern Australia. And one of the important things about looking at the Murray Basin is it's one of just an, of a number of different basins across southeast Australia 
that all have formed related to the initial breakup of Australia and Antarctica over time. So the Murray Basin is by far the biggest, but there's also the Gippsland Basin and the Otway Basin and others in Victoria that are related to the same broad tectonic system in terms of their um, genesis. Um, sitting above the Murray Group and the Unconformity, we have a complex package of estuarine and marine sediments that I'll talk more about in detail of around the five to seven million year um, age mark. And then sitting above that, we have even younger sediments of uh, Lake Bunganya, which I'll talk uh, about in some detail. So the Murray Basin re is recording a pretty um, good um, sequence of sediment right the way from the um, Oligocene through until the modern day. So there's quite a lot of detail that we can tease out of this. Okay, so starting here at the bottom of my diagram with the Oligocene Miocene aged um, sediments, so of the Murray group, the Manum limestone is probably the one that we're most familiar with in terms of the stratigraphic names. Um, this is a well studied, a very beautiful sequence of marine limestone with lots of fossils in it, so people can get really good age constraints and good paleo environmental constraints. So largely it's considered to be a cool water carbonate relating obviously to a significant transgression of the marine environment onto what is now the continental part of Southeast Australia. Um, the thickness of this unit is controlled largely by what's happening beneath it. So we're not depositing the Murray Group on a completely flat penny plane. There is obviously topography related to what we're seeing in the Delamere basement and the other sediments, um, Cretaceous Permian sediments that are sitting on there, which are largely, as I say in a minute, related to trough um, sort of different troughs and different things. So there's some regions where we have quite thick Murray Group sediments and other regions where we'll have much thinner Murray Group sediments. So that topography on the underlying basement is an important part of what we see in this age and also the way in which sea level fluctuated during the deposition of the Murray Group is also important. Um, the other important thing I want to make uh, a point of highlighting now is, as I said earlier, this period of non-deposition that followed the laying down of the Murray Group limestones. So this is quite, again, recognised throughout those basins of southeast Australia and the Otway and the Gippsland as well. There's a significant unconformity about, around about the Miocene-Pliocene um, boundary um, in terms of age. And this is thought to represent the beginning of quite a significant tectonic period dated to be around about 10 million years um, in the past. So there's a period of non-deposition that we need to take into account here as well. Okay, so sitting above that, so we've had that period of non-deposition related somehow to tectonism around that time throughout southern Australia. The package of Miocene Pliocene age sediments that sit above that is largely where I've done a lot of my work, these ones in the younger sequences. And this is quite a complex package in terms of what we see here. So there's three main units that I highlight, the Norwest Bend Formation, the Book Penong Beds and the Loxton Perilla Sands. Um, one of the fun things, or not so fun things, about working in the Murray Basin is the fact that it crosses three states, so South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria all have a section of the Murray Basin. Anyone who's looking at legacy papers or data will often come across really quite unfortunate complexities in the nomenclature, particularly around which unit is which and which units correlate, so that's a bit of an issue. Um, this is pretty established what I'm going to talk, what I've been talking mainly about are the names that we use here in South Australia. Um, so the Norwest Bend Formation is a very restricted unit. It's um, interpreted to represent an estuarine environment. So mainly along that blank area up there, sorry about the, um, this is not working. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Um, um, it's a uh, res uh, restricted estuarine environment. Related to that, there are some marginal marine sediments that are, we call the Book Penong Beds, which are shallow marine type things with really nice um, assemblages of fossils and so forth. But the main unit of this package is the Loxton Perilla Sands. And this is a really quite extraordinary depositional unit. It outcrops over that entire area I've got shaded up there in grey, so more than 500 kilometres um, width. And these units represent shore face sediments. So a series of strand line deposits where we're getting the Loxton Perilla Sands, which are basically beach ridges, fossilised beach ridges that stretch right the way up past the Darling River into New South Wales. So really quite an extraordinary sedimentary package that we've um, been looking at here. And that's what we've spent quite a lot of time looking at. 
And again, it's one of the beautiful things that we've been able to get out of that shuttle radar topographic data is the recognition of these individual strand line units. Um, so some of them, individual ones, you can trace along their length through about 300 kilometres. Others are much more discontinuous. There's a little bit of subtlety in their orientation, but most of them are, are, are around parallel with the modern, modern coastline. Um, dating these sediment is quite tricky, and I was really excited about Stacey's talk about the prospect of some drilling going on in the Murray Basin to go through these sequences. Please, anyone doing some drilling, also take some core from the, from the sand for us, because that would be really nice. Um, obviously, they're very discontinuous sediments, um, in part, which is part of the problem, but also anyone who has done drilling in the past has basically chucked out the sand that they've got from the cover on the top, which doesn't really help those of us who want to understand um, the age and origin of this sediment more so. But we have been able to get some decent dates from here. What we've largely done is found brachiopod sediment, brachiopod fossils within the sand, and we're able to look at the strontium isotope composition of those brachiopods and match it up with the known variation in strontium isotope um, composition of the oceans known worldwide. So it's kind of a pattern matching type um, age techniques. So strontium isotope stratigraphy. Um, I've only shown three dates here in yellow from the Luxton Perilla Sands just to show you the sort of range. We do have some others. Um, are all around about five, uh, five to six million years. The age in white there is from the Bukpenong beds and that's considered to be the uh, marginal marine equivalent of a shoreline which would have been much further inland. So based on these various ages we've been able to put together we have assigned uh, an age range from about 5.4 to 7.2 million years for the deposition of this strand plane sequence. These strand lines have taken people's interest before because they're quite, quite striking features. People have previously thought they were related to eustatic sea level fall with oscillations relating to ice sheet volumes in Antarctica and so on. However, the new dates we've been able to get really constrict to this age range quite considerably. And at this particular time, eustatic sea level was pretty much stable. So there's no way we can explain this progressive regression of the shoreline sequence um, throughout this period by a simple eustatic explanation. So we've come um, to the conclusion that there's some regional tectonic uplift which has driven the formation of this strand plane sequence, which we would argue is almost certainly, almost certainly, the world's largest strand plane system. So it's a pretty special part of South Australia's geology um, that we've got here. But we would argue it's pretty much exclusively a tectonic signal that we're seeing here, related somehow to gradual progressive uplift of the southeast part of Australia at this time. Okay, so after this was formed, um, we think most of the uplift was focused along the Padthaway Way High, which Stacey pointed out earlier, and everything behind that sort of just lifted up gently. Um, regardless of the actual mechanism of what happened, there was a period where we had the sediments being weathered subaerially. The Pliocene was a period of much wetter, more humid conditions um, around the world, and weathering under these conditions formed this really beautiful ferricrete surface with anyone who's worked out in the Murray Basin will recognise, so a really, really nice prominent horizon known as the Karunda surface. Again, we think this is related to a regional tectonic effect because we also see this surface in, in Victoria. It's known as the Timboon surface, um, and there's various other names for it, various versions, all relating to weathering of the same age, similar age sediment during some sort of tectonic um, hiatus. Okay, so this um, brings us to the next little stage. So we've got rid of, um, sorry, we haven't got rid of them. <laughs> we've, um, we've talked about um, the material there that I've labelled as Miocene Pliocene, most of which is actually uh, Miocene in age. And then the Corinda surface indicated there with the little round circles. Sitting above this, and we think as a result of this progressive tectonic uplift, um, my colleague Malcolm Wallace has made an argument in the literature in the past that the Murray River used to enter the sea in Portland in Victoria rather than South Australia and progressive uplift on the Pathway High actually caused that drainage to be defeated and all the, all the water coming from the east piled up behind the Pathway High to form this feature here which I've outlined here um, in the dotted lines which is called um, Mega Lake Bungunya. 
Um, this has been known for a very long time. So I think when Ralph Tate, those of you who've been through Adelaide Uni, you see the Tate Museum down at the um, Geology Department, Ralph Tate was one of the first people to recognise that this lake existed a very, very long time ago. Now we can obviously map it out in much greater detail. We think at its maximum extent it covered more than 50,000 square kilometres of the Murray Basin, so really quite an extraordinary feature. And again, we would argue that this is a result of tectonic uplift. It also does, though, give us a climatic, uh, some climatic information because obviously it's pretty dry in the Murray Basin these days and to be able to sustain a lake of this size there must have been a lot greater rainfall than we see today. Early work done out of um, the BMR suggested that there must have been rain for at least two or three times what we currently um, find um, in this area. Okay, so um, one of the interesting things that we can draw from this is that the contraction of Lake Bungunya must tell us something about the evolution of this um, air part of the world during this time. And it, again, this has been recognised for a very long time. Uh, Walter Houchen in 1929 was the one who pointed out that some of the player lakes that we see in the Murray Basin are remnants of this much um, larger, older paleo lake. So what is the significance of the drying of Lake Bungunya? When did it occur and what controlled what happened there? So this is what we've largely worked on in recent times. Oops. And this is some of the um, work that we've done apart um, with this. So as I said before, the sedimentary fill of the lake, it comprises two units, the Blanchetown clay and the Bungunya limestone. Um, looking at the Blanchetown clay, um, this is a, that's that greeny grey coloured material that we can see here and we tend to see this largely where we've got the river cutting through the sequence, otherwise it's very difficult to, to be able to look at these outcrops. One of the things we recognised was this white layer that I've tried to highlight in a few of these pictures um, and this is a silt layer within the clay sediment. And if you have a look at the grain size of it, it looks very much like it's windblown material. So we've made an argument that this is some sort of dust um, sequence or lurs that's blown in from somewhere else on the continent and been deposited um, within the lake. Our best um, estimate of the age of this is about 1.4 to 1.5 million years. And we argue that this is a major step in the aridification of southeastern Australia. So we had a lot of extra rainfall in the Pliocene, built up this big lake, but gradually over time the climate dried out. And the presence of this dust unit is one of the first markers of a big step, um, big change in the climatic um, regime. So we can notice this pretty much everywhere where we can see the sediments in um, where Lake Bungunya used to be. So over three, uh, 300 kilometres or so will be recognised this same correlatable unit. The Bungunya limestone is the second unit that we, feel, that we find in um, Lake Bungunya as well. Um, and it also gives us a really important clue as to what the climatic um, regime was doing at this time. This is a really thin unit. You, know, you really have to look hard to find the Bungunya limestone. Um, it's only about one to three metres thick and it's a lacustrine carbonate. Um, it outcrops, we found it again, this is a wonderful benefit of the shuttle radar with that I've shown as a, a blow up of it there on the right. And you can see we can recognise what we think are distinct shoreline sequences on the lake. And if we go in and have a look at those spots, you can actually recognise Bungunya limestone on each of these terraces. And the chemistry and the um, uh, macro features of the limestone are different depending on which of these levels that you're on. So we went out and we did some accurate surveying. My husband's a surveyor, which was really handy. Um, I could get him to go out and do it for us. And we can pick these terrace levels out and look at the different carbonate on each of those layers. And so what we would argue this is reflecting is a progressive drying out over the lake over time and the Bungunya limestone is a bit like rings on a bath. So as the lake has progressively dried up, we've had different um, limestone units deposited along there. Um, so we think this is reflecting after the initial step towards arid climatic conditions that we see marked in the Blanchetown clay, then we get progressively increased amplitude um, arid climate cycles throughout this time. Okay, the last two things I want to say, um, there's another important feature that we can recognise in this part of the world and that's the Gambia coastal plain, um, which looks very similar at a different height level from what we see in the Loxton Perilla sand strand plain. And here the strand lines are the Bridgewater formation. And in contrast to our older Loxton Perilla sand strand lines, these ones are, are much better dated. Um, and they seem to be giving a progradation rate of about 90 kilometres per million years. 
Um, you might have registered previously, I had some red writing about the Loxton Perilla Sands, which also gave a progradation rate of about 130 kilometres per million, per million years. So kind of the same ballpark, given the age constraints that we've got here. So we'll make the argument that the fact that the progradation rate of the Loxton Perilla Sand strand plane and the lower down Bridgewater um, Formation strand plane are, are prograding at about the same rate, that this is probably reflecting some regional very, very long term uplift that we're seeing on the part of this part of the continent. So this is why the point that we would like to make about tectonics really impacting quite significantly on the, what the um, Murray Basin dynamics are doing right the way from 10 million years or so right up to present day. One of the things that, that separates the Gambia coastal plain from the Loxton Perilla Sand Strand plain is the Kennewinka escarpment, which we would argue is an erosional feature. So it's not, it's not structural at all, and it's probably the longest paleo shoreline anywhere in the world as well. So quite a lot of important features here. Okay, so just to finish up, um, in terms of what's controlling what's happening in the Paleozoic basement, as I said before, a lot of it is determined by the topography of that basement prior to starting to accumulate the Murray Basin sediments. So depending on whether we've got a little trough present or whatever, we might have thicker or thinner Murray Basin sediments. But what we're going to see in terms of the basement is also going to be impacted by how this tectonic process starting at the Miocene-Pliocene has pro proceeded and how it has affected different parts of the region. We would argue that it, there's a regional signal, but there's also some episodic tectonic tectonism going on in terms of movement on some of these faults over time, which we need to get a bit of a better handle on as well. Okay, so just the key points, I won't repeat them because I've probably gone way over time. Um, <laughs> but um, in terms of the current and future work we would like to do, obviously we'd like to get some better age dates on those sediments. So hopefully the drill new drilling programs are gonna be able to help us out with that. And we'd really love to understand a little bit more about what's controlling the tectonism over such a broad area over such a long period of time. Thank you.